Hello out there. Um, poets, can I get a thumbs up? Can you, can you all hear me? Great, great, great. Thank you. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Michael Wiegers. I'm the executive editor at Copper Canyon Press, and I'm coming to you live from my home in Port Townsend, which is on coastal Salish uh, Sklalem land. Um, thank, I want to thank everyone out there for uh, joining us in uh, celebration of spring, of poetry, of hope and resilience. Y para ustedes quienes están celebrando el Cinco de Mayo, bienvenidos. Um, um, we're getting ready for a live book launch uh, uh, reading with five incredible authors, uh, Kelly Russell Agadon, Caleb Rea Kondrilli, Arthur Z, Nikki Walshlager, and Noah Warren. They're each going to read from their gorgeous new books, which I have right here and I will show as, as they each um, start to read. This is the sixth of our, in, our the sixth installment of our launch party live stream uh, series, which has been a way for us to connect with all of you out there, our readers, and to celebrate new poetry releases in this age of the pandemic. Um, and so tonight's launch party, though, is special because it's also a benefit for Copper Canyon Press, which means it's an opportunity for you to become a patron of poetry and really join us in a mission to publish extraordinary poets like the ones you'll be hearing from tonight. We're also live streaming this simultaneously on Facebook and the event will be recorded and shared later on our website. So again, um, hello to all of you watching uh, from wherever you might be. If it would be helpful for you to see closed captioning, you can en enable captions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's really pretty, uh, cool feature that um, is there now. Um, and additionally, if it would help for you to follow along as our poets read their poems, you can find a PDF of the poems they'll read in order um, by following the link that we're providing in the chat. As many of you know, uh, Copper Canyon Press is a nonprofit independent book publisher, and we've been entirely dedicated to poetry for almost 50 years. Uh, we hope you'll fall in love with the books and authors you're about to hear from, just as we've fallen in love with all the poets over the past 50 years. And when you do, as I hope, it can fall in love with these poems, um, we invite you to make a donation to Copper Canyon Press. And in turn, we'll send you one or more of these collections as our gift to you. We'll drop a link in the chat right now so you can learn more about how to become one of our spring donors. And later in the program, I'll be happy to tell you a bit more about what your contribution will make possible. But before we even get there, I want you to know that every donation made tonight is going to be matched by Lannan Foundation. And in addition to that, um, the first $10,000 we raise tonight will be further catalyzed by a very generous anonymous donor who's offered to match every donation. This is a really huge opportunity for Copper Canyon, and it's going to sustain us and our poets for years to come. So I want to thank you for considering a donation to the press. And while I'm sharing the love, I want to say that we're also grateful for support from our current donors, our board of directors, and funders like Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, For Culture, CLMP, and Poetry Foundation, each of whom are providing crucial relief funds to arts organizations like ours so that we can keep the poetry coming. Again, thank you. And again, to all of those of you who are just joining this Copper Canyon Press launch party live stream, welcome. Let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, and it's my immense pleasure to introduce you to our first reader tonight, Kelly Russell Agadon. Today, Kelly is going to be reading from her new book, Dialogues with Rising Tides. There, you can see it. Great cover. Um, we're going to drop Kelly's bio into the chat so that you can read all about how accomplished she is. Um, personally, though, I really love and admire how deftly Kelly balances heartache and joy, amazement and vulnerability. Her new book features chapters named after lightships those old floating lighthouses, light beacons that helped sailors navigate, navigate troubled waters. Um, I think her book is 
a necessary reading and necessary navigation during these times of isolation. Um, it's a book of great friendship. Um, Kelly, please take it away. Wow, thank you, Michael. That was um, a beautiful introduction. I am so honored to be here reading with um, these great poets, Arthur, Nikki, Caleb, and Noah tonight, and for all of you to be here to celebrate our books. Um, I need to first thank, give a huge thank you to Copper Canyon, who published all of our books during the pandemic and the challenges that came with that. Um, they cared for me and my book so well and know that when you buy their books, you're buying books from good people who uh, are so passionate and love poetry and want to get it out into the world. So thank you. And also, I wanted to give a, a just a quick shout out to my friends and family, though I'm not sure people use the term shout out anymore, but I do have the best poetry community and I know a lot of you are out there. So I wanted to thank you and everyone else who showed up tonight to celebrate with us. Um, I will be reading from this eight day old book, Dialogues with Rising Tides. Um, I chose three poems, I thought, to give you a sampling of the book. Um, and themes it deals with, it will be kind of like an hors d'oeuvre of poetry, um, an hors d'oeuvre prey, I guess. The themes I'm going to be reading about and are in the books are the complexities of humans and our relationships, the environmental crisis we're going through right now, um, but also love and hope. I'll end on love and hope because I think that's important too. The first poem is the first poem in the book. It's called Hunger. And if you like dark humor, you might like this. Hunger. If we never have enough love, we have more than most. We have lost dogs in the neighborhood and wild coyotes. And sometimes we can't tell them apart. Sometimes we don't want to. Once I brought home a coyote and told my lover that we had a new pet until it ate our chickens, until it ate our chickens, our ducks, and our cats. Sometimes we make mistakes and call them coincidences. We hold open the door, then wonder how the stranger ended up in our home. There's a woman on our block who thinks she's feeding bunnies, but they are large rats without tails. Remember the farmer's wife? Remember the carving knife? We are all trying to change what we fear into something beautiful. But even rats need to eat. Even rats and coyotes and the bones on the trail could be the bones on our plate. I ordered Cornish hen, I ordered duck. Sometimes love hurts. Sometimes the lost dog doesn't need to be found. So the second poem I'm gonna read deals with all the plastics in our oceans. Um, Eight billion tons of plastic every year. Uh, I think about that a lot. And when we come to the part in the poem that mentions the turtles, it's an actual headline from a UK newspaper that I snagged for my poem. This poem's called Unsustainable. When you broke my recycle bin, I started calling you fresh kills. I want to keep you in my plastic happy meal heart, but what snaps open stays on earth forever my center floating down a canal until it's swallowed by a seal. Who cares our plastic drifts as a tag along to sunset, an autobiography of artificial, a dead whale washed up in the Philippines, 88 pounds of plastic in its gut. Damn the turtles, customers at McDonald's want their straws. And we could be practical lovers, if we remembered to bring our reusable totes into the store. You said the cashier gave me the stink eye for forgetting. 
but I was lost in my own head, thinking about my grandmother and hospice, leaving the store with a casket of even more plastic bags. It hurts to say my convenience is more important than the sea. I write a postcard to earth, I love you, but watch me navigate your landfills in stilettos. Let me kill your buzz. You know I'm talking about the bees now. My hands in the dirt. If you want to gather honey, don't kick over every hive. And my last poem, uh, we're gonna end on love and hope and trying to love this flawed world. And um, I know it can be hard, but I think it's worth trying to do. Love Waltz with Fireworks. 17 minutes ago, I was in love with the cashier and a cinnamon pull apart. Seven minutes before that, it was a gray haired man in Argyle socks, a woman dancing outside a bakery holding a cigarette and broken umbrella. The rain, I've fallen in love with it many times, the fog, the frost, how it covers the clovers, and by clovers, I mean lovers. And now I'm thinking how much I want to rush up to the stranger in the plaid wool hat, tell him I love his eyes. All those fireworks, every 17 minutes exploding in my head. You the baker, you the novelist, you the reader, you the homeless man on the corner with the strong hands, I've thought about you. But in this world, we've been taught to keep our emotions tight. A rubber band ball where we worry if one band loosens, the others will begin shooting off in so many directions. So we quiet, I quiet. I eat my cinnamon bread in the bakery, watching the old man still sitting at his table, holding his handkerchief as he drinks his small cup of coffee. And I never say, I think you're beautiful, except in my head, except I decide I can't live this way. I walk over to him and place my hand on his shoulder Lean in close and whisper, I love your Argyle socks. And he grabs my hand, the way a memory holds tight in the smallest corner. He smiles and says, I always hope someone will notice. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Kelly. Um, that's such a, a wonderful poem, and um, I believe it's on Vimeo. Uh, there's a there's a short film that Wid's made out of it. That's that's really lovely as well. So um, for all of you out there, maybe um, see if you can do a search and, and find a, a the 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 film made out of that. Um, our next reader is Caleb Ray Kendrilli, and Caleb is going to be reading from Water I Won't Touch. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just realizing now there seems to be something of a water theme going on um, with with a number of the book covers here. Um, and I'd also say, you know, what I just said about um, Kelly's uh, work, I think it, it goes across all of the books. There's there's such a sense of intimacy and and friendship um, that 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 runs throughout all these books. Um, you know, and um, friendship and love. Um, and um, so um, we're going to drop uh, Caleb's uh, bio into the chat um, so you can read about their previous works and honors. And um, as I you know, talk about uh, Caleb's book, I also want to um, uh, give a, I, um, I, I want to acknowledge our um, pandemic intern crew. Um, they drew my, uh, a while back actually before 
um, before the pandemic, um, our intern crew drew my attention to Caleb's manuscript. And when I was, and when I read it, I was so struck by how their poems carry forth an unflinching directness and open-heartedness uh, while remaining generously intimate. Um, these poems demand that life be lived fully, joyfully, and fiercely. Um, perhaps the biggest joy of my job is when I get to call poets to accept their book. And it's worth noting that when I called Caleb to ask if we could publish their book, our interns were standing around the phone with me. I miss having that you know, proximity to, to our crew. And a number of them broke into tears of, of joy. Um, upon accepting this book. Um, so led by, by our interns, as we often are, um, the entire staff has now become huge fans of Caleb and their work. So um, Caleb, please take it away. Thank you for your work and your book. Thank you all. Thank you, CCP. Thank you, the interns. Um, that was a wonderful call to receive. I was in the middle of a shift at the grocery store um, and I was still a cashier at the grocery store, so it was a particularly welcome call. I'm going to read you three poems, um, all from Water I Won't Touch. I love the irony that the people are in the water, you know, on traveling together. In a Super 8 just outside Iowa City, two 12-year-old boys cuddle on the lobby couch, scrolling on their phones. It's four in the morning and they don't expect me or anyone in this holy space they've drawn for themselves. Their parents are asleep on the third floor, resting before a hockey tournament or some other rough and tumble game. It's clear by the way the boys jump as I walk by, their parents know nothing. The floor is lava. The continental breakfast will start soon. The couch they're on is an island I've been to. Young love. You've heard this before. The only way out is through. When my family burnt it all. We even burnt the dolls. I write about this all the time, but have you ever seen anything like it? A pit of ashes and dozens of porcelain hands sprouting up like girlish weeds. So far in this life, I have heard a number of unacceptable apologies, and they have all begun with I'm sorry and ended with Oxycontin. It's a shame the Pennsylvania landscape is just waterfalls, coal, and pharmaceutical drugs. I wish there were more libraries and less violence, but I've always been so painfully hopeful. On Facebook, my sibling's boyfriend messages, they've abandoned me at the airport. I don't know what to do. And I resist the urge to tell him that's what they do to all of us. Instead, I write back, oh no. There are so many ways to be angry at just one thing. I haven't seen my sibling in nine years, and sometimes I have a temper with my hand fruit, bite it a little too hard because chewing is such a frustrated act to begin with. When I was seven, my father said he was gonna push me all the way around on the swing set. I leapt off at the peak, airborne and so sure of his strength. Centripetal or centrifugal, neither matters if your face meets the ground alive with blood and mulch. When I was 11, my father told me the legend of Pope Joan, and I loved how she hid her herness in plain sight, so invisibly woman. She gave birth, was put to death, and I imagined she must have been raped. She must have. I believe that had I known one trans person as a child, I'd have half as many scars as an adult. I could have come around to this body so much sooner and without as many cigarette burns, my whole body a cratered and earthbound moon. Often when I am drunk and alone, 
white men ask me what I have against white men if I want to look like one. And then they follow me all the way home. It seems every man in America has been taught to stalk real quiet in a forest of dry leaves, myself included. I'm not a man, nor do I desire to be, but I suppose I have always been a hunter, armed and unwilling to consider my own shortcomings. After I woke from my double mastectomy, I thought about the day my father killed two doe with one bullet, and we butchered them both right there and then. There are two of everything worth having two of. Now I am so visibly trans, I'm being photographed in white light, scars lit like dogwood crowns. It's hard to know what to make of this when all I've ever known is blood red and a wilderness. Recently, a new cloud was introduced to the Atlas, known for its apocalypse lip color, its mouth opening dark deep, like a sinkhole, or your trans lover's eager and previously abused mouth. Nobody wants to be lonely, least of all me. Maybe I'm interested in clouds because I am one, stratus slice post-surgery, or maybe it's because I'm an air sign and have been missing my family for years, despite all their lava, all their hot, angry fuel. My mother is a better whistler than me, but I think we both understand air and our mouths and the best ways to call for help. Listen, there is a razor in the apple and the apple is the earth. Listen, my nightmares are dreams in which everyone walks the same direction, that rhythmic lockstep. Both of my grandmothers considered abortion. Can you imagine being so close to nothing? And then I've got one more. My partner always tells me what to write about and then I don't really do it. I just kind of put it in the title and then it's my little trick. My partner wants me to write them a poem about Cheryl Crow, but all I wanna do is marry them on a beach that refuses to take itself too seriously. So much of our lives have been serious. Over time, I've learned that love is most astonishing when it persists after learning where we come from. When I bring my partner to my childhood home, it is all bullets and needles and trash bags held at arm's length. It is my strange father's damp bed of cardboard and cigar boxes filled with gauze and tarnished spoons. It is hard to clean a home, but it is harder to clean the memory of it. When I was young, my father would light lavender candles. Now, my partner and I light a fire that will burn all traces of the family that live here. Black plastic smoke curdles up and loose bullets discharge in the flames. My partner holds my hand as gunfire rings through the birch trees. Though this is almost beautiful, it is not. And while I'm being honest, my partner and I spend most of our time on earth feeding one another citrus fruits and enough strength to go on. Every morning, I pack them half a grapefruit and some sugar, and they tell me it's just sweet enough. Thank you so much. Thank you. Man, that, that's, that's really beautiful. And thank your partner also for making that poem possible. Um, our next reader is Arthur Z. And um, once again, um, I will invite you to look at the uh, chat box uh, to read more on Arthur's bio. Um, and you know, we don't really have enough time tonight for me to talk about Arthur and his poetry. I've had the privilege of working with him now for 26 years. And when I say work, working with him, I've been learning from him, you know, just as with his students over the many years at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, he's, he's made them better writers, and I hope he's made me a better editor. Um, and um, I certainly believe that uh, his poems and his 
person encourage me to be a better, more compassionate person. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been a long friendship and um, just a deep um, love of of your work, Arthur. And you know, thank you for entrusting your work to our our care for so many years. Um, please uh, take it away, Arthur. Thank you, Michael. Um just want to start and say it's such a pleasure to be reading with Kelly, Noah, Caleb, and Nikki, and um, celebrating all of our books. I'm going to, the first poem I'm going to read is in the voice of Salt. It's called Salt Song. Zunis make shrines on a way to a lake where I emerge. And Miwoks gather me out of pools along the Pacific. The cheetah thirsts for me. And when you sprinkle me on ribeye, you have no idea how I balance silence with thunder and crystal. You dream of butterfly hunting in Madagascar, spelunking through caves echoing with dripping stalactites. And you don't see how I yearn to shimmer in orange aurora against flame. Look at me in your hand. In Egypt, I scrub the bodies of kings and queens. In Pakistan, I zigzag upward through 26 miles of tunnels before drawing my first breath in sunlight. If you heat a kiln to 2,380 degrees and scatter me inside, I vaporize and bond with clay. In this unseen moment, a potter prays because my pattern is out of his hands. And when I touch your lips, you salivate. And when I dissolve on your tongue, your hair rises. Ozone unlocks. A single stroke of lightning sizzles to earth. This next poem is called The White Orchard. Under a supermoon, you gaze into the orchard. A glass blower shapes a glowing orange mass into a horse. You step into a space where you once lived. Crushed mica glitters on plastered walls. A raccoon strolls in moonlight along the top of an adobe wall. Swimming in a pond, we notice a reflected cottonwood on the water. Clang, a deer leaps over the gate. Every 15 minutes, an elephant is shot for its tusks. You mark a bleached earless lizard against the snowfall of this white page. The skins of eggplants glistening in a garden. Our bodies glistening by firelight. Though skunks once ravaged corn, our bright moments cannot be ravaged. Sleeping near a canal, you hear lapping waves. At dawn, waves lapping, and the noise of men unloading scallops and shrimp. No noise of gunshots. You focus on the branches of hundred-year-old apple trees. Opening the door, we find red and yellow rose petals scattered on our bed. Then light years. You see pear branches farther in the orchard as the moon rises. Branches bending under the snow of this white page. This next poem is called Adamant. Deer browse at sunrise in an apple orchard while honey locust leaves litter the walk. A neighbor hears gunshots in the bosque and wonders 
Who's firing at close range? I spot bear prints near the Pewaukee River, but see no sign of the reported mountain lion. As chlorophyll slips into the roots of a cottonwood and the leaves burst into yellow gold, I wonder, where's our mortal flare? You can travel to where the Tigris and Euphrates flow together and admire the inventions of people living on floating islands of reeds. You can travel along an archipelago and hike among volcanic pools steaming with water and sulfuric acid, but you can't change the eventual adamant body. Though death might not come like a curare dipped dart blown out of a tube, or slam at you like surf breaking over black lava rock. It will come. It will come. And it unites us, brother, sister, boxer, spinner, in this pact while you inscribe a letter with trembling hand. Uh, just two more poems. One is short. This next poem is called Pitch Blue. And in the section of new poems in this new and collected, there's a pitch blue, a pitch magenta, and a pitch yellow. And together, the three colors add up to make white or white light. But I'm just going to read the first one, which is called Pitch Blue. I can't stop wading into a lake, skipping one flat stone after another across the surface of a pond. In a sarcophagus, lapis inlaid along the eyelids of a death mask, wool oxidizing when pulled out of the dye bath. Like a deserted village with men approaching on horseback, the moment before collision, never light this match. And the last poem uh, is called Transpirations. Leafing branches of a backyard plum, branches of water on a dissolving ice sheet, chatter of magpies when you approach, lilacs lean over the road, weighted with purple blossoms. Then the noon sun shimmers the grasses. You ride the surge into summer. Smell of pinyon crackling in the fireplace. Blued notes of a saxophone in the air. Not by sand running through an hourglass, but by our bodies igniting. Passing in the form of vapors from a living body. This world of orange sunlight and wildfire haze. World of iron filings pulled toward magnetic south and north. Pool of quicksilver when you bend to tie your shoes. Standing, you well up with glistening eyes. Have you lived with utmost care? Have you articulated emotions like the edges of leaves? Adjusting your breath to the seasonal rhythm of grasses gazing into a lake on a salt flat and drinking in reflection the Milky Way. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, really beautiful as always. Um, I think before we um, started tonight, we were all, of course, commenting on the beautiful bookshelves behind you and and I think that your poems are very much like those those bookshelves. There's just so much to unpack and learn uh, from there. So 
We have two more um, really incredible poets to hear from tonight. Um, but if you're feeling as inspired as I am, uh, I do want to again invite you to consider becoming a donor to Copper Canyon Press um, to help keep us publishing um, daring, bright, socially conscious poetry collections like these. And I want to remind everyone that every donation tonight will be matched not only by Lannan Foundation, um, but also by an additional anonymous donor who's going to match the first $10,000 we're able to raise. Um, so in other words, your gift will be tripled tonight. Um, so I, I hope you will consider um, making a donation and we'll drop uh, that link into the chat. Um, and thank you in advance for your generosity. So, and so without um, further ado, I'm happy to introduce uh, Nikki Walschlager, uh, reading from her new collection, Water Baby. And um, you should see Nikki's bio in the chat shortly. And I encourage you to learn more about this brilliant poet. I'm going to again refer to our ever incredible interns as they talk about Nikki's work. Um, they were great early advocates for her manuscript when it uh, came through our offices. And, and really that's at the crux of what we do in publishing. You, you find your, your own, you move from intimacy to intimacy, the intimacy of the writer to the final intimacy of the reader engaging with that writer. And, um, and to be able to advocate for that, that moment of intimacy is what, what we try to do as publishers. And, um, and when, I, when I first read Nikki's poems, um, encouraged by, by that enthusiasm, I was immediately taken by a voice that was inviting and disarming um, and full of humor um, and at the same time that it was tender and curious. And I just loved Nikki's way, ability to turn the quotidian into an extraordinary experience of lyricism and truth telling. Um, it's really a phenomenal book and I'm so proud um, to be a part of it at Copper Canyon. Nikki, your turn. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone at Copper Canyon for making this event and all of our books possible. <clears throat> Valley of Things. Hang your head when you walk. Yesterday's news is greener. To survive ham with ideas of a common holiness. Decisions to make about what's going to siphon off your thoughts. Fuse giddiness to the citizen elective, creature by creature. When a very young child throws down an object, it's beautiful to watch. They don't know about the value of signification hanging over the riverbanks. A good poet prays to nature. I brush out tangles during graceful animal hunting season. Sometimes we hear a crush, figure out a daily schedule, read tortured philosophers, listen to James Booker on repeat. Women are doomed to be the angels of love. This is so true. I involuntarily doodle hearts everywhere I go. I sign my letters compulsively with hearts, dream of disobedient hearts, work with hearts. I eat them. I boil sauces and the tomatoes on my cutting board form a daisy chain heart. My feet are bound in red ballet slippers, Lisa Frank style, engorged with crusty satin hearts. I pronounce my name with an embarrassingly hearty accent. My colostrum pools with the plumping of an inflamed heart, inspired by the nutritional needs of my babies. Hearts are spray painted on trains like talismans, guiding me eventually to the heart afterlife, 
where my treasured friends exist in heart time, drinking wine and organizing a workers collective named Heavenly Valley Emotional Workers in the mossy hidden heart clouds where my restless heart tires of hearing famous singers singing sweetly about unsatisfying love in the grocery store when their hearts could be screaming about environmental devastation and global capitalism. The way this callous dorm pillow I saw online plastered with hearts and dream catchers says only good vibes is in no way related to what the hearts of this country really need. On good days, I submit to being a committed student of the heart. On bad days, I'm paranoid and anxious about my heart being kidnapped by intruders in blue uniforms. And how a scene in Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom where the sacrificial victim's heart gets ripped out in one of Hollywood's stereotypical cinematic presentations of indigenous culture sent me a message about men who are so powerful they could take what they wanted from my body with their bare hands. Where do bad folks go when they die? Asked Kurt Cobain on my favorite Nirvana album. I replace folks with hearts and marvel at the candor of strange smarmy men on TV who want to be president, who have no clue being part of a community is different from purchasing investments in a city. My heart is stone sore. My heart wants to close forever to protect me from market combat. But as a woman bred for strength and openness, I lack options. I'm pretty good at the precarious art of choosing what gets in. Since doom makes a great gatekeeper, it's rainwater in a vase of roses on a sleeping hero's grave. It's a daisy. Bats twin the sky, drowsy from building home to watch night court. I, Nikki, as a contemporary woman, and bound to ask, spiraling in the faucet, if you keep no lie relaxers on your hair pattern, the original crimple pattern becomes more defiant. Memories won't comfort me. Perhaps it's best not to trust the politics of people who haven't washed their own dishes in 20 years. Oh, missile management. I request a transfer for the masses, a happy howling cocktail showing instead of telling this country that I cannot with you. A free daylight may be possible, the revolt in us, I mean. Stems are still holding like a grown up, but they snap. You pick me up, pour me another bath, a glass of something dry for the blisters. Read Ted Jones' hand grenades. Remember that I'm not the only one and cry. When the devil leads us home and yells surprise. Is that your house, he asked. This used to be my house, I said. But those are not your people, so that can't be your house. But it is my house, I said. I had some people, maybe a few. Even though those are not your people, even though they don't look like you. I had to live somewhere, I said. This is the house where I lived. But where are your people, he said. My people live in a different house. They don't care to know about me. If you're the devil, why are you asking me questions? The devil said, since the house you had to live in is gone, I thought you'd be happy. 
It sure is a hot day, I said. Of course it is, said the devil. Why do you think I work in town? William Carlos Williams. After I left, we hung it in the sky so everyone can see what black women have done for the world against our will or not. I discussed it with the stars and they agreed to hold up the part of me that will burn the longest since the labor it took to live down here can never be repaid. But most people recognize it as a constellation called the Big Dipper. Anyway, once there was this poet who wrote a famous poem about everything depending on a broken down wheelbarrow rusting in the rain. I think fairly highly of poets and still give them ideas. And this man was also a doctor, quiet and thoughtful. When he was going about his day, I whispered about the ugly wheelbarrow I spent a lifetime with, pushing it back and forth for the fire. William, I said, reaching through the wind to grab his ear. He was walking with a black umbrella and enjoying the mild rain shower. There was a farmhouse coming up the road with a wheelbarrow in the front yard. Someone kind had planted red geraniums in it. He slowed and faced the direction I was pointing, noticing for the first time the homely little wheelbarrow. Smile lines broke through the slow earth of his face. Something good was happening. He was sure of it. And so was I, because I told him. This will be my last poem. The Lunch Counter of Eternal Tears. Instead of crying on your shoulder, I cry on the internet. Instead of crying, I make allusions to crying by cherry picking the subjects. Instead of crying on his shoulder, I build a fountain of black amethyst in an artificial square. Instead of crying, I ring the bells of a bottomless robe. Instead of crying, I listen to Roy Orbison's crying because the way he waterfall sings, crying, feels like a worn leather booth that wouldn't refuse me service. Instead of crying, I understand what I'm sacrificing for someone who's long gone. Instead of crying, I think of lurid romantic scenarios where I'm not crying and you're the one being insufferable when you think about me. Instead of crying, I listen to Put Your Head on My Shoulder by Paul Anka. And I recognize how some songs are never about deep emotional connections with special people, but for getting in the pants of willowy virgins. Instead of crying, I put on Live Evil by Miles Davis to smudge the room of 1950s white nonsense. Instead of crying, Miles' trumpet screams like the last free lion dying alone in the wilderness. Can I lay my head on your shoulder and cry? Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That was that was wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a sucker for for poems that you know, call in other poets, you know, be it Ted Jones, who I love, or William Carlos Williams. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an easy mark uh, in that respect. Um, so um, bringing us to our final poet of the night, uh, Noah Warren, um, whose new book, The Complete Stories, I'm sorry, the sun is just now on this gray day in the Northwest decided to um, come in and create a glare on everything. But his new book, The Complete Stories, is a beautiful, uh, beautiful collection. Um, and um, you know, just picking up where where I was uh, just saying, you know, being a, a sucker for um, for references to to other poets and um, 
the traditions. Um, you know, uh, Noah's work, I love the community that he builds in the poems, um, the community of, of uh, friends who are poets, of family um, who are writers. And um, yet, I, I think that what really shines in this book is that rather than simply accept the anxiety of the influence of those around him. Um, he's really um, confronting uh, a larger literary ancestry and um, you know, calling forth, uh, if you will, that, that from the shelf of books uh, behind Arthur. Um, he, def he defines his, his own voice within this, this larger ecosphere of, of literature, um, while also celebrating um, a community and direction entirely of his own making. His poems are, you know, beautifully sculpted and um, have, you know, so many um, wonderful formal considerations working through them. And it's, it's a book that you can read over and over and um, discover uh, new things in it. Um, so um, uh, Noah, please give us a little taste of it uh, this evening. And thank you for your book. Well, no, Michael, thank you. That was very kind. And uh, it's true. I do love, I do love books and I do love people. Um, and, uh, and I love the book that, you know, the, the book people at Copper Canyon have made, which is so beautiful. Um, and I definitely just want to thank Michael and the whole, in, you know, to the audience invisible team who are just such pros and really, really caring. Um, I'm going to read four poems tonight. And I was thinking, and, you know, they're all just kind of about time, the weirdness of time. Um, the weirdness of description and uh, how time clarifies some things and make other makes other things impossibly impossibly vague. Um, the first two poems are uh, faintly tropical. Um, my mother's mother and her family came over from Cuba during the revolution there, um, and I think you know the poems bear the trace of that. Calendar. Probably in another decade, I will remember mostly the natural beauty of the key, which its nascent touristic development, the reason I was there, had not yet entirely effaced. Such thought was, however, unavailable to me then, doubled over beneath the banana trees at the edge of the island, retching with what in the lucid moments between spasms of deep skeletal pain and the dry contractions of my guts, I was sure was cholera. There were tiny fish skeletons and loose translucent ribs strewn about the dirty white sand. I was now lying on my side on, panting weakly, letting my head sink down on my arm, closing my eyes against the stripes of sun that slashed between the blowing fronds. Episodes of shivering occurred in different places of my body like earthquakes. Forced to choose between suffering in the thatch-roofed eco-cabin I had rented, which had no windows or furniture except for the army cot, and was furthermore infested by large pulsating frogs that clung silently to the walls and crawled to new positions when you turned the single light bulb out, and the beach. I had chosen the beach. Hiding my face in the crook of my arm, I could still hear above the sloshing waves, the faint discordant tinkling of the goats, or rather their bells somewhere upwind. I had seen them climb spindly palm trees, albeit bent ones, with an agility that made me incredulous, even as I witnessed it. They stood in the tops of the palms as if in the centers of small green explosions, swaying around with the breeze, looking placidly at nothing. This next poem is called Operation Pedro Pan, um, which was a, uh, an operation run by the Catholic Church in Cuba, uh, which evacuated uh, children without their parents to the United States. Um, it's how my uncle Rich came over. And there's an epigraph um, from Caliban's speech in the Tempest, the Isle is full of noises speech. The epigraph is, be not afeard. Operation Pedro Pan. This is the man with a tight black beard 
that cascaded curling to his nipples. This is the man with the strong teeth and the belly laugh flashing full of teeth. This is Anivo, who in this country called himself rich. Rich, who towered over me. Rich, who arrived first in a red coat t-shirt. And when they opened the hatch onto a blizzard, laughed and laughed at the sugar spinning down. Rich, who vanished into the mountains for a while and came back and smiled. Rich the careful, the claims adjuster, the trembler, then the trembler, gnawing his fingers to remember the tempest prayer, then in his rage, misting us with spit. This is Rich with a scabbed vellum scalp and his liver seeping diazepam, the right half of his face white as cloud, his dry lips slowly wrestling around the clear tube. This next poem is also called Calendar. Some waves came up overnight, though in Norderney, there was no weather. At the commercial wharf, a thin stream of white exhaust rose vertically from the ferry. The first service would depart soon. The puddles lay dark in the stone streets and in the garden and on the narrow walk. A bank of haze hung a hundred meters offshore, perfectly still. While at the end of the long pier, the shallow bottom chalk that Tomas had restored, good at hauling, bad at sailing, knocked against the pilings. It was regular enough that you began to expect the next knock, but then there was none, or two came quickly together and the effect broke. Marta had been up before us and made coffee and laid out the table for breakfast. A blue cloth, mugs, plates, and silverware, three zinnias in a thin white porcelain vase. We helped ourselves to brown bread and cheese and the least strange looking of the meats she had rolled thinly on the tray. We ate quickly, gazing out the small window at the blue and purple sky, the path down to the water, the long pier. And this last poem um, is also about the strangeness of time. Um, it's called Buildings. I see their streaked faces and recessed entryways, their windows washed white by the rain. How cheerful, how brave. Your voice was as you asked if I wanted anything from Whole Foods, where you had to go amid all the other Wednesday clutter. Turning back, you paused in the door, backlit by the morning gray. Between us lay five years of love, which you talked about as a quantity that accumulates. And that morning was the beginning of that night, morning, day, and night. Those 36 hours, 10 months ago now, when you convulsed with a new raging sorrow, which I surprised you by returning, but more viciously, finding as I broke from the self I'd made, charring ecstasy. Hours of weeping and reasoning, of fucking, drinking and take out, hours of storming out and creeping back and kissing dead lips once more to be sure, hours I refused to remember, that hardened into the low city I walked out into already retreating from me. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Um, speaking of the uh, weirdness of time, we're actually a little ahead of schedule. So I thought I would um, you know, start and uh, ask, um, ask all of you um, one question. Rather than doing a, a traditional Q&A, um, let's just start with one question and, and see how that goes. Um, 
and uh, and I want to also invite everyone out there watching uh, to answer the question too. Um, you can type your answer into the the chat box or um, the the um, uh, Facebook comments section, and it's it's really a pretty simple question, you know. Um, at Copper Canyon, we're really wanting to know how um, poetry has sustained you or strengthened you or, or made you more resilient. Um, and um, particularly during this last year and a half or um, this last five year or five years or this lifetime, however you choose to answer it, um, how has poetry sustained you, nourished you, strengthened uh, you or given you resilience? And we'll go in reverse order. So uh, tag Noah, you're it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think poets maybe had, you know, for a second you thought you like you had a leg up um, in the beginning of the pandemic because you're like, no, I have the time. Now I have the books and um, I'm used to my friends being virtual anyway, you know, that it's just like slowly fuming up out of the pages. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess I, after a couple of months, I started writing these poems. Every poem was called talk and, uh, you know, every, maybe a different sense of talk was working in different ones. And uh, they were chatty and lonely. And, you know, I realized only so late, so belatedly um, that I was trying as hard as I could to kind of write the conversations I wished I could be having, you know, the kind of late night talks and, uh, you know, laughing at the right moments and uh, holding each other when things got sad. So, so um, I'm going to turn to you next, uh, Nikki. I just want to, um, I quickly, I'm we're getting some answers from our readers. Uh, Mark Tradinick uh, says poetry makes chaos over into coherence. It transfigures pain into beauty. That all helps. Um, and um, that, along with what you just said, Noah is. Um, beautiful. So, Nikki, um, how would you answer it? How has poetry sustained me through just the pandemic yeah. or in general? <laughs> in, in general, in general. I don't want to be too specific. It's a wide okay. open question. So answer as you see fit. Um, I mean, I'm still writing like I always have. I've been writing for a really long time since I was a teenager. I've been writing poetry. Um, Having my book out during this pandemic, I think has been, a, you know, really nice, even though we don't have to get, even though we don't get to be in person, it's helped keep my mind off of what's going on. So <laughs> yeah. it has its so. benefits, being able to see people on the screen and people that you wouldn't normally see. I don't know if I would have the time to do all the traveling so this, you know, it works out. It's still connection with others. Wonderful. Yeah, I, um, you know, personally, you know, each new book we publish, each new manuscript, um, uh, uh, I, I read and encounter, you know, it's, it just, you know, gives me hope. And, um, you know, um, I think, um, realizing that we're we're in in a community of words, and um, so um, Arthur, uh, could you maybe speak a little bit uh, to it? Um, I hesitate to sort of use large, you know, big words, but for me, poetry is uh, a kind of spiritual sustenance. It's blood, it's fiber, it's uh, it's essential as breathing. It really helps um, me have a kind of stamina. I find a kind of uh, nourishment and transfiguration in terms of some of the chaos and difficulties in the world to um, really see what matters. And to um, it's so important to our inner lives and to our um, for us to develop the kind of stamina and resources uh, we need as people to act mindfully and fully present in the world and I think in small ways to make a difference. So, you know, poetry for me is language at its most intense. Um, it changed my life when I started writing it and here I am 50 years later 
feeling like I'm just as excited writing now as I was at the beginning. And that sense of poetry is um, just a kind of astonishment and amazement at the world and uh, giving a kind of gratitude as well. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I'm going to just chime in um, with a with another of our uh, Copper Canyon Press's uh, poets. Uh, Jennifer Knox writes, it allows my brain to reach across the universe and reconnect distant wires. Um, I, I love that. Um, and then um, another one that that is um, uh, beautiful uh, is um, from uh, Jesse McCollum. Um, Poetry was the first thing that gave me the space to think about myself and to talk to myself about my transness. I really struggled with poetry in my undergrad because I felt so disconnected from my voice and myself. And I felt pressure to share things that I wasn't ready to. But when I started writing again this last year, I was able to come to terms with my needs, struggles, and ways I wanted to live first through words. That's been really powerful to me. and. Um, you know, I feel the same way. I, I, I discover who I am through poetry so often um, and in ways that I may not be able to articulate it myself. Um, but um, Caleb, um, could you maybe answer it? Yeah, I think when I was young, uh, the ways that I could really start feeling myself develop empathy was through story and reading. Um, and now that I've started writing, the most exciting part and probably the thing that keeps me writing is I can feel every time I finish a poem, something change about my capacity for empathy. Um, I feel it stretch. I feel myself grow. Um, and I think I get softer the more poems I write. So that, that's how it sustains me. Um, so uh, just a couple of others um, that I want to um, to read from, from our audience. Um, let's see. Um, I, I love this one from Veronica Kornberg. Poetry puts me in conversation with caring and observant hearts across time and space and blood. It turns on the lights in each dark room. Um, that, that's lovely. Um, so, um, Kelly, um, would you take, uh, take a turn at this? Sure. Well, I would love to take Arthur's answer. That was um, a beautiful answer. And so much of what poetry is for me, um, I think the way it sustained me is, you know, um, the things that I'm afraid of or can't control or um, feel powerless against when I'm able to use words to turn them into art, um, I feel then they can't get me, they can't control me, they can't, I control them. And so that's one way it's really sustained me. The way it's kind of nurtured me is um, just seeing how many poets there are in the world and how many people are writing poetry today and all the new poets and poems coming up, all the literary journals. To me, I think there's always room for more poets and more poetry readers. So I've been thrilled to kind of see it expand. It, it just, all of it nurtures me. There's nothing about it um, I can think of that doesn't. So, um, well, I'm going to uh, uh, invite any of you to take another bite of the apple. Um, I see that Noah has uh, written a, a comment here. Um, poetry is as uh, cosmic repair. I love that as well. But um, do you have questions that you want to ask of one another? You don't have to. Or if you want to elaborate uh, on it, um, I can continue. Um, we've, we've got so many great responses here from our audience, but um, um, you know, I, I could spend the rest of the night reading these aloud. Um, um, you know, citing other poets, I, um, the, the wonderful poet Randall Mann um, writes, uh, reading Laura Jensen and Bill Knott have reminded me of how personal, how intimate, how original poetry is. They both write like no one else exists, which is often how I have felt. Um, um, and Dana Levin, another Copper Canyon poet, 
poetry can hold paradox, confusion, and dichotomies. Um, so, well, um, I'm going to just see if I can um, wrap this up here. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got a few more. Well, um, yeah, I, I think that that's. Forgive me while I try to just um, digest all these these questions. Um, you know, I want to thank you all um, for you know coming and joining us uh, this evening, um, and um, for sharing your responses uh, to you know why poetry. Um, I think it's also um, you know this is the time where I, I can uh, bring us all to our final invitation tonight uh, to become a donor of Copper Canyon Press. Um, I can't stress how big an opportunity this is for us uh, tonight. Um, it's um, I've been privileged to be a part of this organization for for 26 years, which is incredible uh, to me. You know, I've uh, uh, learned and grown alongside poets, um, and I've. But during all this time, I don't think I've ever uh, witnessed um, such an ex ex existential threat um, to the press uh, as during this past year. Um, it's been one of the most challenging um, we've had to face. Um, you know, not just at the press, but across the globe, um, and. Um, and yet through you know, such incredible poets like the ones who read tonight and the ones that are going to be forthcoming and the ones that we've published over you know, our history, um, we're, we're being sustained. Um, and we are sustained not only through those poets, but through all of you, um, the, the donors and the readers, um, as well as the poets. Um, we, without, without the poets, without the readers, there's no reason for us to exist. So, you know, thank you, thank you um, for helping us, you know, keep the doors open and to keep us going. And I hope that um, um, we will uh, be able to continue to do so um, for, you know, another 50 years, another, you know, um, another 50 years of Copper Canyon Press and beyond. Um, through through tonight and through my my work at the press, I hear over and over how poetry um, sustains uh, and enriches our lives. Um, your belief, um, your readership, your audience, um, and your donations um, sustain our lives at Copper Canyon Press. Um, so, as you're considering making a donation, please remember that it's going to be matched, um, um, tripled tonight. Um, by a combination of Lannan Foundation and an uh, anonymous donor. Um, so thank you all for your generosity. And thank you, thank you, thank you um, to, to Noah, to Caleb, to Nikki, to Arthur, to Kelly. Um, you, know, you make us all a better press and um, um, better readers and, um, and better poetry people. So. Um, thank you for uh, making tonight possible, and um, I hope to see you all in person soon, um, preferably around a dinner table, breaking bread and sharing poems. Um, and then thanks to all of you in the audience who we can't see. Um, I would love to, to do the same thing with all of you as well. Like Noah said, you know, I like people and I like poetry. So have a good night and um, stay safe and stay kind. Bye-bye.